Alrighty, so in this video we're gonna take a look at the webhooks repository which is gonna store our data inside a MongoDB database. This video is gonna be an introduction to how you can work with MongoDB, how you can create a collection, how you can run migrations. We're gonna take a look at how you can index your data and why do NoSQL databases scale so well horizontally. My name is Vasily Olenik and this video is part of the .NET architecture series where we are building a modular monolith notification system using industry's best practices. Okay, so the first thing that we need to get our webhooks repository up and running is a MongoDB instance which we're gonna set up using Docker Compose. Over here, we can see the default settings for a MongoDB container, which we're gonna use. The next thing that we'll need is NuGet packages, which we can find under directory, sorry, packages. And over here, we can see that we have MongoDB driver version 2.21.0. So this is the package that we will be using inside our webhooks repository. Next thing that we want to take a look is inside the webhooks repository. And over here, we want to take a look at the contracts and we have an iWebhooks repository. Inside it, we have a couple of crude based methods, save, delete, get and get list. For now, I'm using only the save and get list since those are the two that I want to take a look. And over here, you can see a small message that we can make this as a generic repository if we will want to do it in the future. For now, there is not really any need to do that anyway. As for the other two things that we have over here, two classes, we have a get list async, which is an I paged and I sorted query, where we send by default uh, the following parameters over here, the event code, tenant code and source code. Since we want to filter out webhooks by for each tenant, for each application and for each uh, event code. The source code property over here is obviously gonna be the application code of the one that emits a specific event. Class over here is obviously our webhooks. We have an ID, we have an endpoint that we want to call. We have a code of the client, basically the code of the application that we want to call. We have the code of the source application that emitted a specific event. We have the event code and we have the tenant for whom this application is. What's most interesting for us is the services part over here. And basically inside here we have two folders, the data and infrastructure. First, we are gonna go over the data. So we have data mappings and this is a basic profile that we have seen previously in, uh, in all our other services. So it's a hand mapping. Uh, to data model and to the contract. The migrations folder we're gonna cover a, a little bit later. However, as a spoiler, we have an add sharding JavaScript file and an initial migration over here. Next, we have the models, the webhook data model, which is basically just as the contract itself. The only difference is being that we have specified here explicitly using attributes that this is the ID of our object. Uh, next we have the settings that we will need to run MongoDB and MongoDB itself has a couple of settings over here, connection string, database name and the webhooks collection name. All three are, have the attribute required over here and we're gonna see in a little bit, why did I add these three attributes? Well, it's obviously that we need those, but the question is how we can use these attributes to validate our settings. And we have a simple specification, well, a simple set of specifications over here. So first being for application with a specific code, for an event with a specific code, and for a tenant with a specific code. Basically, we're just gonna reuse these specifications in cases when we need to filter out our webhooks by code, by sorry, by source code, by van code or by tenant code throughout our webhooks repository. And now we have come close to the webhooks repository installer over here. And we have two methods. First of all is adding webhooks repository. And over here we have a couple of things to mention. First of all, we add options as MongoDB settings. We're binding the configuration from MongoDB, which is which you might be familiar with. Then we run validate data annotations. And this method will trigger those data annotations that we have seen previously and validate that our settings are valid. And then we're just gonna run it 
on start. Then the only thing that remains is services at transient iWebhooks repository and adding the webhooks repository itself. The second method is a little bit more interesting as it's a way to apply migrations, JSON migrations. For us, it's mostly about running indexing and sp setting up indexing for our connection. So we're basically just creating a Mongo client, creating a Mongo database and sending it over to the initial migration class that we have seen previously. So we apply the migrations, uh, first of all, checking if the collection exists. So if the collection does not exist, we're going to create this set collection and then we're just going to apply indexing. However, we will return the, to this part of code in the second part of the video when we will be talking about how how a NoSQL database scales and why does it scale so well. Let's take a look at the webhooks repository. So in here it's pretty straightforward. We're gonna get a context which is essentially a MongoDB collection of our model from an instance of MongoDB database created with our settings. Delete async is pretty straightforward. We're just gonna run the delete one async and then double check on the count of deleted entities. Get async is also pretty straightforward. We're just gonna run a find over our collection by ID and then we're just gonna return it as a contract. The next one is a little bit more interesting since we have over here a lot of different specifications. So it's a get list async which we're going to use for getting our webhooks for a specific application, for a specific tenant, for a specific event code. So on the UI part and inside our um, event processor, we are interested in receiving all the webhooks for a specific event or a specific tenant. For, yeah, obviously a specific application. So we are running those three checks over here. Next, we're going to just sort out list itself, we're gonna run a total count, then we're just gonna run the query and get our results, which we're gonna return inside a paged list. The save method works pretty much the same and over here I've found myself a small issue that I have. So basically I'm checking that there should be a webhook with this source code to I'm basically checking if there is any. And the save async works pretty much similarly to how. And the save async works pretty much the same way. So we have a MongoDB query. We check if there is a webhook already for this application, for this event, for this tenant. We're just gonna return true. If not, we're just gonna assert insert one and return through to the caller. However, I've seen, I've found myself here a mistake. So we need to check as well that the client code is the one that we have passed into the webhook since this three specifications will return a list of different webhooks. So even if it's for another client, we're just not gonna insert. So we will need to add one more specification over here. Let's do it really fast. So it's a webhook specification for a webhook specification data model. Over here, we just need a string client code and we're just gonna return the criteria. So it's a webhook and basically webhook.client code to lower should equal the client code. We will need this on a new line. And that's it, removing this and basically just replacing over here the source code with client code. So this should be the real implementation. We're checking for webhook for an existing webhook with the source, client, tenant and event code. Uh, then we're just, if it exists, return true and do nothing else. This get webhooks sort column is pretty similar just how it was previously in the pagination video. I'll leave a link down in the description below. So with all that, this is basically the webhooks repository that we're gonna use and we're gonna connect to the database itself and save the data. However, we're not gonna expose this webhooks repository directly to the consumers. We're gonna use it throughout our webhook service 
in order to set up our data since this is essentially an internal service to our system. The usage itself is pretty straightforward. So inside our webhook service, we have a couple of contracts. We have the command and a command to create a webhook. If you are familiar with CQRS, this approach should be really familiar to you. So we have a create webhook command with a specific URI, client code, source code, event code, talent code, the properties from the webhook repository. We have a validator, so we have our data validated. And next we have routing and inside here we have basically a couple of methods. So we have a method group with a create webhook endpoint that we have over here. We validate a create webhook command and send it over to a mediator. The webhooks routing installer is basically just saying app use endpoints so it's bona fide like in all our other services over here returning back to our mediator so we have the contracts we have the routing itself then we have the services and inside the services we have the handlers for create command handler we go over here essentially we're just gonna query the source application by code then the client application by code so we are querying another internal service by its public interface basically to check that both the source and the client application specified in the webhooks validator exist if any of those does not exist we're just gonna return an exception then we're just gonna call the webhooks repository save async and save the data for the webhook the querying looks just the same so we have the get webhooks query which is really similar to how our internal the webhooks repository get webhooks query looks like. So we have source, event, tenant, paging, all that stuff. In the query handler, we're just gonna basically get create a get list async query and then pass in over the parameters and return it as a paged result. So let's see it in action. So I'm gonna just debug. We have our two endpoints over here. And basically I just want, I'll be creating an webhook the client code is going to be notifications since this is the code of the application that we specified in our application registry during the seed the source code was going to be the same one since i don't have another application and there are the two checks so we're just basically going to assume that this application is going to listen to its own events which is nonsense for the moment but let's go for it the event code will be webhook underscore created and the tenant code will be let's say for example uh, why silly i'm gonna run this one right now and we can see that we have a 200 response over here how do how can we check our data basically i'm using on mac os i'm using visual studio code on windows you can have the mongodb compass so I have installed the extension for MongoDB and I've added the connection string from the app settings. So right now, if I just refresh this, I can see that I have one document over here. And this is exactly the data that we have sent to our endpoint and which we wanted to create. So to the other endpoint that we have defined is for getting a list of webhooks over here. We have the notifications, webhook created and Vasily uh, filters applied. We're just gonna execute it. And we can see that we have returned a list of items. It's page zero with a page size of 10 with our webhook created. So, so far we've basically set up our MongoDB. We've saved our data. We were able to successfully retrieve it. Uh, we have the methods for getting one, getting a list, deleting it, etc. Now let's take a look at how can uh, and why do NoSQL databases scale so well horizontally. For that, I'll go over here and open a drawing from the documentation. So we have the NoSQL database. So NoSQL databases have this concept of sharding or partitioning. You can find it under both names in the documentation. What it essentially does is basically you split up your data in specific shards or partitions based on some specific key. In our case, it's going to be called a shard key. This shard key might be just a single column 
for example, the ID, but it's obviously a bad example or and even a bad decision to select it as a short key. Or it might be a combination of multiple uh, columns, multiple values. And basically on based on those values, you're just gonna spread your data across different shards. Choosing the short key, however, is the hardest part of it all since an invalid decision might lead to you to a state which is called hot and cold partitions or shards, where basically some of your partitions are accessed more often than the others. And this essentially mitigates all the scaling benefits that you're gonna get from NoSQL database. It's important that all your shards or partitions to be accessed in an equal amount. This is very hard to do from the get-go. What I've seen from time is basically at some point you just decide on the shard key and you see that, well, this would be a good example. However, you can set it up from the get-go. And uh, if you're right, you're gonna reap the benefits of scaling horizontally your databases. In our case, I'm just gonna go with the shard key being the source application code plus the event code. Since we want to access the data based on a specific source application and event. So I, I, as a user of the platform, I would like to enter and see all the webhooks for a specific application. Basically, that will be the primary use case in my case. And this combination of fields will fit me perfectly. Now, how we can set up this shard key is really straightforward. So inside our migrations over here in the webhooks repository, I'm just gonna open the migration, the initial migration itself. Over here we have apply indexing. Basically we're just gonna get the collection itself, then we're gonna specify the keys. So in our case it will be the event code and the source code. If you want to add one more, for example, the client code into the shard key, you can set up one more ascending and then x.client code. Then you're just gonna run the index options, create index, and with this small shard key index, I wanted to call this column and specify that this is basically the index and create one. What this will do is inside our MongoDB over here, you can see that we have the schema and over here we have indexes and we have this shard key index based on the event code and source code. And we have the index on ID, which is a really bad idea in general to index based on the ID. However, we are really right now running MongoDB as a single instance. We're not applying any kind of sharding over there or anything else. Uh, I've taken a look at some open source project and over here you can see a GitHub repository where we have a shard MongoDB Docker uh, image. Personally, this was the one that I was taking a look previously when I was just learning MongoDB and how to work with sharding. So it helped me a lot get myself up and going. So I'll leave it one in the description below and it integrates really well. So if you will run this locally, you're just gonna go to app settings and instead of the username or password connection string that we have over here, you're just gonna specify this one below connection string and basically connect your application to that setup of MongoDB that we have in that GitHub repository. It's Anyway, it's not any kind of sponsorship or anything like that. I just loved the way it's set up over there, so I'm just sharing it with you. By the way, yeah, storing your username and password like this in the app settings is a bad example as well, since you would personally use a vault. And we're gonna take a look at how to do that in one of the later videos and how to securely store or all, uh, all our app settings, but that's for another time. Right now, thank you for watching. If you like this kind of content, subscribe to the channel, leave a like, leave a comment, it helps me a lot. I'll leave a link to some other video over here till the new one comes out. And until then, have a nice one.